join us for this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate it. We've got great attendance today. Um, uh, a couple reminders before we get started, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we're going to post that recording shortly here afterwards on our LinkedIn page and on our homepage, which is networksgroup.com. There's a Q&A tab on your screen. Add your questions there, and we'll be sure to tackle them at the end of the presentation. So I'm Dave. Uh, I've worked at Networks Group for uh, about nine years. Uh, I've worked with the team for about 16. Uh, and then at the beginning of 2020, I took on the role of president here just, uh, just before the pandemic hit. Um, while I'm not thinking about cybersecurity, I'm usually either out running or working in my wood shop, uh, but still thinking about security a little. Uh, currently training for the Detroit International Half Marathon, uh, which has the distinction of running across the Ambassador Bridge into Windsor and then back through the Windsor Tunnel back to Detroit and being the only underwater mile in a marathon. Uh, I have two daughters who play in the Michigan Marching Band, so most days you see me, I'll have maize and blue and uh, supporting that crew. Dan Stewart uh, is joining us today. Dan is the founder and president of Jackson Health Tech Advisors and a longtime networks group partner uh, that works with us to focus on cybersecurity advisory services. Uh, Dan has been in the IT services industry for more than 30 years and spent the last 10 focused on cybersecurity risk management and mitigation services. That includes a cyber liability insurances insurance services program that we'll be discussing today. Uh, Dan has three grown children and eight grandchildren that keep him busy when he's not assisting clients. And um, Dan lives in Atlanta with his wife. Uh, they're both huge Georgia Bulldog fans. I gotta say, Dan, after watching the Wolverines lose to the Bulldogs at the Orange Bowl in Miami last year, <laughs> I may not be as big of a fan as you are, but welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Sorry, Dave. Appreciate being here. <laughs> and uh, Michael Cross. Uh, Michael is Vice President of Operations for Networks Group and Overseer of our Corporate Operations. Um, prior to joining the Networks Group team, he was a customer of Networks Group for over eight years, where he was uh, CIO of a midsize enterprise. Michael has over 20 years of experience in IT and spent much of his career leading IT teams for mid-sized companies across many different industries. When he's not solving security challenges for our customers, he loves to golf and spend time with his family. How's that golf game coming along, Michael? Uh, it's a work in progress, and I think it will be for the rest of my life. But uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. I'm excited to present this information. Great. Welcome. So for today's discussion, we're going to start at a high level uh, about cybersecurity pressures. Uh, we're going to talk about how cyber liability insurance fits in. Uh, there's a lot going on in this market, so we're going to talk about the trends. We'll get into what your policy should cover and some challenges involved in getting said policy. And I never like to pose a problem without a solution. So we're going to talk about the help we can provide. Uh, as a reminder, uh, there's a Q&A panel where you can add your questions, and we'll do our best to address those uh, at the end of the at the end of the presentation. So before we get into today's content, a little bit about Networks Group and our services. We are headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary as an organization this summer. Uh, and we focus on helping our customers solve security challenges. Our customers are companies that understand the importance of security, but are constrained on resources. That could be people or money or time. And we offer three basic families of services. Compliance, this is a foundation for us. Uh, and while being compliant doesn't necessarily mean you're secure, all the services that we build meet or exceed compliance requirements. 
Uh, we're a PS, uh, PCI QSA company, so we can help with uh, payment card industry um, assessments uh, as well. Uh, pertinent to today's discussion, uh, we can help design and evaluate your security program and advise on an important part of that, which is cyber liability insurance. Stepping on to defensive security, uh, this is where we help our customers to design, deploy, operate, and defend secure networks. We do this across businesses, big and small, across industries, across technologies, and across geographies. This gives us broad visibility into security challenges that everybody's facing today. On to offensive security. This is where we leverage the visibility we get from all the customer environments we manage, as well as a wealth of other threat intelligence to stay on top of the tactics, techniques, and procedures that attackers are using in the wild today. By, using our, by approaching our customers similarly to how real attackers are, we can provide great insights as to how an attack may unfold against a given organization and help provide a remediation roadmap that allows for risk-informed decision-making. So a little bit about the pressures we're hearing from our customers. Um, many organizations build robust security programs because it's a sound business strategy. Many more do it because someone tells them they have to. Uh, and we've seen this evolve over time. It started with compliance frameworks. Then customers layered on when they realized they were being targeted through their supply chain and connected vendors. Remember back to the days of the uh, Target uh, store breach where it was their HVAC vendor uh, that was targeted. Now we're seeing insurers layering on as well with cyber liability insurance questionnaires being a huge driver to today's focus on security. Um, I can tell you that these questionnaires in this process is, is imperfect, it's evolving, but, but it's not fundamentally wrong. Uh, the insurance company's priority is not to pay out on these claims. Uh, and so their guidance is designed to help you build good security. And what we're seeing is this marketplace, the cyber liability insurance marketplace is on a path to really help develop minimum viability security, minimally viable security standards across organizations and across industries. And frankly, I think that's a, that's a good thing uh, and it will, it will help us all. So Dan, I'm gonna hand it to you to share some facts and figures on what's going on in the state of cybersecurity today. Great, thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. We, we certainly appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedules to, uh, to join us. It makes sense from our perspective for any discussion of cyber liability insurance to begin with an overview of the current state of cybersecurity and its, its potential impact uh, on your organization. It's probably no surprise to anyone uh, that's attending the webinar today that the cybersecurity threat landscape continues to evolve and uh, has grown almost exponentially since uh, 2019, driven primarily by ransomware attacks. So to put it in perspective, I'm gonna give you uh, some statistics. I know how everyone loves statistics, uh, but globally, the average cost of a data breach in 2021 was $4.24 million. Ransomware attack average cost was high, a little bit higher than that at 4.62 million. As you would uh, suspect, the United States was the country with the highest average total cost of a data breach, which was over $9 million per incident. So, you know, you can say, oh, gee, well, that's overstated because there, there were several mega breaches that occurred uh, during uh, 2021. But I think the important point here is that it's increased in terms of the average total cost by 30% from 2020, which had increased uh, 30% from 2019. 
Since the pandemic started, we're seeing a 40% increase in the number of overall attacks. Uh, talking about ransomware specifically, 66% of all organizations uh, globally across all industries were hit by ransomware in 2021. That's a 37% increase uh, from uh, 2020. 46% of the organizations that were hit by ransomware in 2021, they paid the ransom. And the average payment was about $812,000 uh, per incident. And of course, that's dependent on industry. Some industries, it was a lot higher than that. Some industries, uh, it, was, it was lower than that. So according to Palo Alto Unit 42 Ransomware Threat Report for 2021, Globally, there was a 144% increase in ransomware attacks from 2020. And even more concerning was an 85% increase in the number of victims that had their identity and other details posted on the dark web leak sites. And, and this is sort of an example of the changing tactics of the bad actors, uh, as well as just an increase uh, in, in double extortion. So business is growing, it's booming, if you would. Uh, Cyber Security Ventures projects that uh, by 2025, the cost, the global economic cost of, uh, of cyber crime will be uh, $10.5 trillion. And that's a 15% increase year over year from now until then. Certainly no slowing down in, uh, in 2022. Uh, in February of, of this year, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency reported ransomware attacks against 14 of our 16 critical US infrastructure sectors. One of those sectors, uh, healthcare, through June of this year reported 337 data breaches, accounting for more than 19 million records. So those are a few stats. And I know, you know, you can uh, kind of prove anything with statistics and, and everyone in the industry is, is doing these statistics now. But I think the point here is that the cybersecurity environment substantially is increasing the risk of all organizations. So let me turn it over to Michael to discuss some of the reasons for the growth of this uh, cyber threat landscape. Michael? Hey, hey, Dan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump yeah. in here. I, I know yeah. I said I was going to save questions for the end, but uh, <laughs> I'm not, yeah. uh, because I, I saw one come in that seemed pretty pertinent to the content you were just talking about. Uh, and you said the word ransomware a whole lot of times in, in mm -hmm. talking about the current state of cybersecurity. Uh, and so this question is, um, if I have ransomware, Will my insurance company pay the ransom? Well, that's that's an excellent question. Um, it depends on the carrier and the policy. Uh, today, the carriers are are being uh, pressured uh, by government and and other agencies not to pay ransom. But at the same time, that's what their clients are wanting them to do. So, with the exception of one. Um, one vendor, AXA, uh, who has stopped paying ransom for their clients in France only, but it hasn't impacted the U.S. Uh, all of the other carriers that are still providing cyber liability uh, insurance are paying ransom, but they are beginning to move back on that, you know, in terms of just cutting the coverage limits for, for this form of cyber extortion. So they're not paying as much. They may say, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll pay 50% of it this time as opposed to uh, 100%. Uh, and at the same time, and we'll talk about this as, as we move through the presentation, the uh, cybersecurity requirements uh, are increasing significantly um, for their clients. Uh, so in other words, in order to qualify for underwriting, then you have to have certain things within your cybersecurity program that you're not only uh, adhering to, but, but proving to the, the insurance carrier. And then finally, if they're going to pay the ransom, 
the premiums and the deductibles are are going to skyrocket, and and they have across the board, but especially when you consider uh, cyber extortion and ransomware uh, payment. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, Michael, you're up. All right. Uh, so thank you, Dan, for all that great information. Um, you know, the, the question that comes to mind is is why is the threat landscape continuing to grow? And I think. Uh, the answer, bottom line here, is that it's insanely profitable for the bad guys. Uh, Dan threw a, a bunch of statistics out there that, that support that fact that um, it's good business uh, to, to be in the business of cybercrime right now. But there's other factors as well that are in play here. Um, when you think about uh, hacker sophistication, the tools, the techniques uh, that uh, the hackers, the bad guys are using, um, are, are they're becoming more sophisticated, they're becoming more complicated and harder to protect from as a result. Uh, a lot of the tools are now available for sale on the dark web. Uh, you may have heard of uh, ransomware as a service. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of sophistication going on uh, in that space to, to, to make it even harder to defend against. Um, the increased nation state activity, uh, you know, especially with all the uh, things that are going on across the world and countries attacking other countries. That's happening in the cyberspace as well. And so we're seeing a lot of increased activity in, the, in, that, in that arena. Uh, lots of business challenges. The uh, last uh, two years have been really hard for businesses and IT and security professionals uh, just because of how quickly we've had to change the way we conduct business uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, organizations who may have been adopting cloud strategies, may have been adopting remote work uh, uh, you know, policies, uh, were literally overnight forced to make those changes wholesale in order to keep their business running as a result of the pandemic. And anytime you have, uh, you know, you turn your focus to making systems available and keep, keep people working in new ways, uh, security takes a backseat. And uh, so it's, it's not, it's not unusual or not unexpected for us to see organizations really trying to play catch up on their security programs as a result of these changes. Uh, other challenges, including you know, workforce shortages, there's not enough people to go around uh, for the, the roles that are available, especially for cybersecurity professionals. There's hundreds of thousands of jobs that are going unfilled uh, across the country in cybersecurity. And so having the requisite talent on staff to, to solve the security challenges is really difficult right now. Um, and, you know, funding issues as well. This is, a, this is an old one uh, for, for uh, us old guys that have been in this business for a long time. We can tell you that it's always, uh, you know, uh, a challenge and a fight to, to get the dollars you need uh, to, to support your cybersecurity programs. And so... There's a lot of things going on that are contributing to the growth of uh, the threat landscape. And it makes it really difficult for you know, uh, individuals responsible for IT and security to determine what their risk is, determine what the level of risk is appropriate uh, for their organization and, and areas where they need to focus and, and bolster their program. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, people out there, a lot of organizations that are out there to help. In fact, there's, there's over 3,500 vendors in the United States that provide cybersecurity services, but how do you know which one is right for you? How do you know which one is going to solve your problems in the best way? Um, all of this is resulting in tremendous surge in ransomware attacks and, and really at the bottom line, hugely profitable for the bad guys. So the question is, okay, so why do I need cyber liability insurance? Why is it e essential? And I think it's very simple. In the current and projected cybersecurity threat landscape that we just talked about, if you haven't been attacked, well, congratulations. But it's really not a question of if you will be attacked, but it's a question of when and how you will be attacked. So cyber liability insurance itself can help organizations mitigate risk through managing the fallout from a cyber attack. Again, we're assuming that if you haven't had a cyber attack, you're going to have one. So, so cyber liability insurance really, uh, you know, the proper type and, and the level will transfer much of the risk of financial damages 
uh, to the insurer. And those include things like you're going to see here, loss of productivity, service disruption, reputational damage, re regulatory fines, victim compensation, and re response and recovery activities. Now, we'll talk about response and recovery activities quite a bit through, uh, through the presentation, but they are um, very, very important. When you're looking at cyber liability insurance coverage, this is an area that you really have to focus on because again, this is all about your back end. And through, through these response and recovery services, cyber liability insurance can, you know, not only reduce the time frame of you to get back to business, but, but also then reduce the financial loss uh, of a cyber attack. To give you an example, uh, in 2021, uh, the cyber liability breach life cycle uh, was about 367 days. And that's made up of two components. One is the, the amount of time it takes you to identify a breach, which in 2021 was 287 days. And then the amount of time it takes you once you identify to contain it, which was, was 80 days. So according to the IBM Ponemon Institute, the data breach report of, of 2021, if you were able to identify and contain a breach in 200 days or less, you would save about $1.26 million uh, you know, in terms of your overall uh, breach cost. So response and recovery is, is incredibly important of the services that you're going to get from your, your cyber liability insurance vendor, but it's not a substitute for overall strong cybersecurity controls. You've got to have a comprehensive security program. You have to have your own incident response plan. You've got to have an IRP team. You've got to continuously test that as time goes on, as, as, as your environment uh, changes. And all of this is in conjunction with the right uh, cyber liability insurance policy. And together, those will appropriately lower risk and lessen the impact of a data breach. Um, but let me just emphasize the word right. Uh, the ability to really determine what is the right and the best and the most affordable policy for you uh, is very difficult. And, and we'll talk about that. But again, the point here is that cyber liability insurance is an essential component of your overall cyber security program in, in the protection that, that, uh, that you provide and, and the ability to manage and mitigate risk. Yeah, and, and to, to further that point, Dan, thank you. Uh, you know, putting business ethics aside for a moment, uh, saying that you have strong cybersecurity controls in place uh, when you actually don't uh, is going to result in really bad uh, day for you when you have a breach and uh, go to your insurance provider. Uh, a couple of relevant examples here. Um, this is an ongoing story right now that, that just was announced a couple weeks ago where uh, Travelers Insurance is suing a customer of theirs for breach of contracts and trying to get the contract nullified on their cyber liability insurance because uh, when the customer filled out their cyber liability insurance application, uh, Travelers, Travelers Insurance asked them a bunch of questions about their cybersecurity program and the customer said, yep, we do all those things, check the box, we got it. Well, that customer had a breach and uh, through the investigation, it was determined that the breach occurred through an MFA misconfiguration and uh, the, the customer essentially said that they had MFA implemented in a certain way and it proved to not be the case. So now Travelers is, is suing uh, that, that customer for quote, misrepresentations, omissions, concealment of facts and incorrect statements related to their application process and, uh, and asking the court to declare the contract null and void. Um, uh, to further that, uh, Travelers has also said that they would have never granted that customer a cyber liability insurance 
policy um, had they known the state of their cybersecurity controls. Uh, another example uh, more, more close to us is a, a customer story where uh, we had a customer of ours who had a, a relatively small breach uh, in their environment. There was some uh, business impact, uh, loss of productivity, loss of revenue, uh, but it was relatively small in the grand scheme of things. The customer chose to exclude their cyber liability insurance provider from that incident, uh, from the response and recovery of that incident, uh, because uh, there was a fear that um, their lack of controls in that particular place would end up raising their rates when they go to renew the policy. There was also concern that the policy would not cover uh, this breach because of the lack of controls. And so um, it all goes back to uh, you know, Dan's point about in cyber liability insurance being part of a strong cybersecurity program, not in replace of. And the CLI providers are going are to mandate that moving forward. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. We, we had another, I think, pretty pertinent question just come in on, on this topic, uh, and that is, we've had a cyber incident in the past. How will that affect my future coverage? Well, typically, uh, that won't negatively impact your future coverage. Uh, there's, there's one big caveat to that, and that is, You've got to demonstrate to the the carrier that you identified and remediated the vulnerability or the vulnerabilities that uh, that caused uh, the incident, and as appropriate, made other improvements in your cyber security program. You know what we've seen is that most clients and organizations that have a cyber event, they end up making changes. Uh, to their cybersecurity program that, that typically strengthens that and at least uh, make sure that they don't have the vulnerabilities that caused the original one. So again, I would say it, it shouldn't negatively uh, impact your future coverage at all. Unless you don't learn from it, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, just as the threat landscape uh, has impacted all industries and, and organizations, it's also had a profound uh, effect on the cyber uh, insurance market. And if this market wasn't complicated enough, I mean, it, it, it is, you could say it's, it's a chaotic, uh, you could say it's a hard market because it's, it's more costly and less capacity. But in 2021, ransomware attacks alone cost the world economy $21 billion. A good portion of those damages were, of course, uh, covered by the cyber insurance uh, carrier. And COVID-19 uh, you know, further exposed the weaknesses in our cybersecurity systems as, as all industries were forced to very quickly institute uh, remote working functions. So, and then there was all these other uh, breaches that occurred outside of ransomware. So, so altogether, these factors caused major losses for the insurance carriers that re it resulted in several market changes that, again, if they haven't impacted your organization, you just probably haven't uh, been up for renewal yet, but they certainly uh, will impact them uh, the next time that you're looking for cyber insurance. So how do they how do they impact your organization and, and what changes uh, took place? Well, the first was there was a, a fairly significant reduction in the number of carriers that provide cyber uh, coverage. Now, if you look in the marketplace today, you say, oh my gosh, there's, there's tons of, of, uh, of vendors that are providing that coverage, which, which is true, but many of them have just gotten into the market recently. You know, they see uh, gold in them or hills. Uh, and they really are not what we would call legitimate uh, providers of, of these services. Uh, we believe there's probably six, eight, maybe 10 uh, insurance carriers that really have the policies and, and the type of coverage that, that most organizations will need in this current uh, environment. Secondly, uh, everyone that's still in the business uh, has put significant limitations on uh, the coverage. 
Uh, I mentioned before in one of the questions that there was there's only been one uh, vendor so far that is no longer paying ransomware. Um, and and that's only in one country, which is, is France. But in general, the insurers are, are walking back some of their, their coverages, but what they're doing is they're, uh, they're also limiting the amounts that they will pay and the risk that they will take. So uh, the third area is really more aggressive underwriting. And this is another way that the carriers are trying to reduce their risk with regard to, they're saying, okay, you've got to have some fairly stringent cybersecurity requirements in place. Not only tell us you have them, like, like Michael's example before, but you have to prove to us that you, you have them. For example, multi-factor uh, authentication across the organization, encryption, endpoint detection response, network segmentation. I mean, even things that, you know, you would consider from a security perspective, a basic uh, blocking and tackling like uh, consistent and up-to-date uh, patching protocol. So all of those things, if you want to be underwritten, you're going to have to adhere to the cyber liability insurance carriers requirements. Uh, then we have the increase, and we've talked about a 20 to 50 percent increase across all industries in terms of the premiums. The deductibles have gone up, and, and of course, that's obvious because the cyber liability carriers have lost so much money over the last two years. The other thing that's important to note here is that cyber liability insurance is, is relatively new. It's not like auto insurance. It's not like life insurance where they actually have actuarial statistics that really predict the losses that they may have, which then in turn would give them the opportunity to, to really uh, set these premiums at an appropriate level. So they've, they've kind of gone overboard uh, with, uh, with the premiums. And the other factor with cybersecurity is they really don't understand where the market from a cybersecurity perspective is going. They know it's continuing to grow, but they don't know exactly where uh, it's going. And that's, that's in general. And then finally, these changes have resulted in the insurance carriers that are still providing the cyber liability insurance. They have a plethora now of coverage types and ancillary services, and maybe more importantly, uh, additional exclusions and if you uh, have looked at uh, a policy lately, uh, they're quite voluminous. I mean, they're, you know, 200 pages uh, and a lot of that is exclusions. So all of this together makes the determination of, of again, quote, the right policy for your organization uh, much more complex. So what should you look for uh, in a policy. We've listed some of what we believe are the key elements of uh, cyber insurance uh, coverage. And, and, you know, there's really uh, two types uh, of uh, coverage. There's first party coverage, which, you know, covers uh, losses due to a breach of your organization. And then there's third party that covers losses that protects your business when a third party brings a claim against you, uh, a client, an employee, uh, victims, the government, uh, et cetera. So, so we've got a combination. Most of these are first party coverage, but, but uh, there's a couple that are third party. So we'll go over these. Uh, and we are, think that these are the ones that you should definitely uh, look at uh, as you're trying to figure out what components uh, of coverage you really need. And, and we're, we're doing this in a simplified manner as well, because as I said, uh, you know, you talk to the, uh, the brokers, you talk to directly to an insurance carrier representative, and these things uh, become um, uh, quite murky and, and, uh, and difficult to understand. So first is business interruption. Business interruption is very uh, simple. Uh, if you have a breach uh, and it impacts you operationally, then the lost profits, the fixed expenses, and, and other costs uh, will be paid to you because of your inability to be fully operational. Uh, the, and that's first party. The uh, second one is contingent business interruption. 
And, and this is coverage for revenue. If the vendor that you're working with, that you say you heavily rely on, experiences a breach that causes your organization to suffer financial losses, then those losses will be covered. This is a very important, uh, especially most organizations are working with uh, just a myriad of uh, business associates uh, and third parties. So looking at business, uh, contingent business interruption is, is incredibly important. Cyber extortion is really, uh, in this day and age, is, is more about ransomware than anything else. And it could cover things like hiring a negotiator uh, and even making uh, the ransom payment itself. Uh, incident response. Um, I've talked about this two or three times. It's coverages for costs that are incurred for responding and recovering from a data breach. And that can include forensics, incident containment and remediation, uh, victim notification, public relations, credit monitoring, et cetera. And, and this is essential to a cyber liability insurance policy for, I, we believe, all organizations. Then there's legal expenses. Uh, and this is really third party because we're talking about uh, defending uh, against customer class action litigation and funding potential uh, settlements in the event of a cyber incident or uh, a data breach. Then, of course, there's regulatory fines and penalties, uh, state, federal, local. Uh, if you have a breach and they determine that you're not fully adhering to pretty much baseline cybersecurity laws and requirements, then, uh, then you can be fined and, and penalized. Liability and, in, uh, and expense costs really focus more on the cost in defending lawsuits that are tied to network security liability as well as electronic uh, media liability. And then cybercrime is just uh, financial fraud. It, it, it protects you uh, with regard to electronic theft, fund transfer, uh, invoice manipulation, you know, those kind of things. So, so the coverage limits the deductibles, the triggers, the scope, and the premiums really uh, crazy can vary uh, greatly from one carrier to another. And then again, as we'll get back to this, it's also very much dependent on the overall level of risk mitigation and protection that your current cybersecurity uh, program uh, provides. So the challenges for attaining the right coverage, I mean, how, how do you do this? Uh, in the past, you know, most organizations, uh, if they had cyber in, uh, liability insurance at all, uh, it was just like any other insurance. And, and many times uh, they, they use the same vendor for uh, all the different insurance coverage, workman's comp, uh, your professional liability, all of those, those type of things. Those, those have changed with the increased complexity of not just cybersecurity, but also the increased complexity of the cyber uh, insurance market. So now you really need uh, a checklist uh, and, and a process that you go through to be able uh, to attain that right coverage. So the, the first thing that you need to look at uh, is to quantify your level of risk and also your risk tolerance. And really to do that, you, you need to have an internal team uh, that consists of finance, operations, IT, security, legal, communications, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and you really need to look at things like, okay, have you had an attack in the last two years? How did that turn out? Uh, do you have a formal cybersecurity program? Do you consistently do security risk assessments and the recommendations for remediation, are you, you, do you progress on that in terms of executing uh, those remediations? So one of the difficult pieces in, in determining what coverage you really need and what's right for you is to actually quantify your risk. That's very difficult uh, to do. The second uh, on the checklist would be then review your current uh, policies. You know, what's going to change with the renewal? 
Uh, you can internally review your policy with your broker or directly with the carrier, although sometimes we find that the broker, the carriers don't really understand what your needs are within your organization. Maybe they don't understand the industry and maybe they don't understand the current cyber uh, landscape. But, but review that policy uh, and you should start that at least six months before uh, the renewal in uh, the term is up. So organization review, uh, that's something else that you need to do because, because that impacts not only the cost of coverage, but how much coverage you really need. And that's things like, it's based on the industry you're in. It's based on the size of your business. So for example, the more employees you have, the more access points there are, the more vulnerabilities uh, typically. It depends on the amount and type of sensitive data that you collect uh, and how you store it and how many records you have stored. It depends on, uh, do you have PCI requirements? Uh, do you have a security program currently in place? So all of those things uh, you need to look at to, to begin to determine along with your risk level, uh, what you really need from a policy perspective. And that's the next step, determining coverage types uh, and, and limits. And, and this, is, this is not easy to do internally because of some of the things that, uh, that we talked about uh, before. So you need to go out and evaluate and compare um, your cyber liability insurance carriers. And that includes you know, your current carrier. You know, what have they done? Have, have the carriers recently updated their policies and their options? Are they utilizing technology to improve the service that they have to you, automation, uh, things like that? Uh, what about reporting claims? How do they do that? Do they have a, a 724 hotline? Is it done by the phone? Or, or do they use just kind of standard business hours? Um, what experience do they have with cyber incidents? And believe it or not, the best carriers are the ones that have, uh, have had the most uh, uh, cyber incidents with, uh, with their particular clients. Do they know your industry, which I mentioned before? Uh, you need to, to look at their customer satisfaction. Uh, premium and deductibles, uh, again, are going to vary widely. Company reputation part of that customer satisfaction. And then finally, financially viable. As I mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a bunch of uh, new vendors that have come into the marketplace that may or may not be financially uh, viable. So you want to make sure that if you do have a breach, that your carrier is going to be able to cover uh, those particular losses. Then once you do all that, and again, that's very difficult. Once you do all that, uh, then you need to decide, do we renew with the current carrier? That may be the easiest route to go, uh, or do we go out to uh, the market? If you go out to the market, then you need to match the carriers with the coverage that you believe that you need. And then, and that's probably, you'll probably find uh, two, three, maybe four uh, that you want to look at. Uh, but then you have to determine based on their underwriting requirements, do you really qualify? And if your renewal is not coming up for a while and uh, you don't qualify and there's a particular carrier or carriers that you're interested in, then we go back to the remediation requirements so that you will qualify for underwriting. If not, you, use, uh, you complete the applications where you can meet the underwriting requirements and then review final bids and make uh, a selection. To do that, and then negotiate and execute the agreement. But to do this internally is just a, you know, I can't emphasize enough, and I don't want, I don't want this to sound self-serving, but this is a huge challenge. It's, it's a huge challenge to understand your risk and understand the, the increasingly complex cyber liability uh, insurance uh, environment. So how can networks group help? Well, as, as I mentioned, uh, the increased complexity of the current environment really 
dictates a, a step by step process. So we put a program uh, together that's directed and executed by cyber insurance and cybersecurity specialists to provide the services that, that, that you may need to enable your organization to successfully go through the process to attain the best coverage at an affordable cost, which is obviously most important. We have a seven-step methodology, uh, and you can select only the services that you need, of course. So uh, the first step is, is the current policy and organization review. We look at uh, your coverage limits, your cost, your term, deductibles, triggers, premiums. We review your organization size, as I mentioned before, and some of the components if you do it internally. Uh, the next step, which is, is really part of this, is that we'll do a high level assessment of your current cybersecurity posture and, and taking a look at your overall risk profile. What, what uh, controls do you have in place? Uh, what are you doing from a third party contract standpoint? Uh, we take all that, we develop the findings, recommendations, we put a remediation plan together. We work with you then to create a roadmap that prioritizes the items that need to be in compliance with, with some of the new cybersecurity insurance requirements, uh, as well as improve the, the overall maturity level of the organization's security program. And then uh, if needed, we work with, uh, with the organization to, to provide the remediation services to address and execute some of these required initiatives. Because of our understanding of cybersecurity and the cyber liability insurance uh, market space, um, we can help you fairly easily determine the carriers uh, to evaluate. We understand their detailed offering, uh, offerings, uh, and we'll we'll go through those. We'll review policies, uh, you know, with anywhere from two to four insurance providers, depending on what your needs are and, and, and how you qualify. We'll help you narrow the list to one to two. We'll assist in completing uh, the applications. Uh, we'll uh, receive the underwriting details and, uh, and, and help you uh, with that. Uh, and then uh, we'll work with you to uh, make a final decision to evaluate the alternatives, assist in contract negotiations if, uh, if that's required. Uh, and then uh, we have ongoing support as needed. And, and as you can see, this is, a, this is basically a life cycle of cyber liability insurance because uh, as you go through the process, uh, you, you're going to have continual changes you know, if your term is 12 months, over that period of time, there's going to be continual changes that you may or may not need to make some changes uh, to your policy. So, so through that, we can provide ongoing support again, uh, as requested and as needed. Uh, thank you, Dan. I just want to share a couple of stories here, and, and I'm so excited that we're able to help uh, our customers through uh, much more of the cyber liability insurance um, process. Now, uh, we, we have been helping our customers for years in, in certain places, and I'll, and I'll share a couple of stories. Um, first off, uh, in many cases for our customers, we are an extension of their IT team performing security functions for the organization. And so uh, undoubtedly, uh, when those renewals or those initial applications come in for liability insurance, uh, we get involved and uh, try to help our customer fill out those applications. Um, uh, in many cases, we're operating the security systems for, the, for our customer. And so the questions are very pertinent and relevant to, to how we do that. And so that's something that we've been doing for some time and we'll, and we'll continue to do uh, uh, through this uh, advisory services program. Um, we have seen recently, uh, very recently within the last couple of months where uh, customers are going to renew their uh, liability insurance and uh, the provider is not only asking them much harder questions and much more comprehensive questions, but they're actually going and validating that the things that you said are actually true. Uh, cu a customer of ours, uh, went through the renewal process and the uh, provider came back to them and said, you do not qualify for a policy because 
uh, we took the information you provided us and we went and tested it and found a whole bunch of things that were, were wrong that you, you said you did, but you, you, you didn't. Uh, we helped that customer uh, kind of untangle that because if that wasn't true. They actually had those controls in place. And what we determined was that the insurance, uh, the underwriter was scanning uh, the customer's website, which was hosted by a third party website hosting service. And so when they went to scan the IP address that the website resolved to, it brought up a whole bunch of other websites that were not owned or managed by the customer. Um, so uh, working in uh, hand in hand with that customer to kind of uncover that and help them, you know, uh, re, uh, re-engage that underwriter to, to have that conversation, just another thing that we, we've done. And um, I'm going to reiterate one more time here that uh, insurance, it's not a replacement for security. It's of a good security program. Um, uh, it is not uh, gone are the days where you could just transfer all of your risk. Uh, that's not a way uh, to solve security any, any longer uh, because you, you frankly won't get a policy if you try to do that. So um, again, reiterating the fact here that uh, CLI, good CLI is part of a good overall comprehensive security program. Dan, Michael, thank you for all the great info today. Uh, we talked uh, primarily today about how we can help around cyber liability insurance, but of course, any CLI program is going to look for all the basics needed to build a good, mature security program. Networks Group can help in a variety of ways, including a variety of assessment services and expertise to help design, operate, defend secure networks. Um, security is a team sport. Uh, we'd love to layer in and help you where, where you need the help. Uh, we've had a handful of questions come in here. So let me, uh, let me address some of these as we, uh, as we wrap up. Uh, let's see. Um, what is the difference between working with networks group versus working directly with an insurance broker? Dan, you wanna tackle that? Sure, I, I think there's really two key differences. Uh, the first is we're not trying to sell you uh, insurance. You know, our objective is for you to get the best coverage for your needs at an affordable price. Uh, if you're working with an insurance broker or if you're working with, directly with the carrier, they're trying to sell you everything they can sell you, uh, which is you know, how they make money in their, in their business. So, so that's not our approach. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're just trying to make sure that you get the right coverage uh, to meet your needs and you're able to afford it. Uh, secondly, uh, I think one of the differences that, is that we not only understand the cyber liability insurance market, uh, but we're also experts, in, as Dave just uh, kind of went through, in cybersecurity and information technology, uh, which, again, is, is different than, than many and most of the insurance uh, uh, brokers and the drug carriers. Another point that, that I would just kind of throw in there is that as, as we went through uh, the, the program services, part of those services include assessing and helping you remediate your vulnerabilities to not only improve your risk posture, but also to uh, enable you to qualify uh, more broadly for cyber liability insurance. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, next question here, our finance team is responsible for insurance for our organization. How do I help them pick the right cyber policy? You want me to take that? Uh, well, I'll start. Uh, I can start with a uh, okay. first part of that, and that is uh, we view security very much as a team sport uh, and cyber liability insurance being a part of a good overall security program uh, means that uh, this is uh, filling out, completing, uh, finding the right uh, liability insurance, cyber liability insurance policy is not something that can be just done by the finance department. So uh, we're of the opinion that uh, you know, working with the finance team, along with IT, along with your security 
professionals uh, in your HR department, getting everybody together and tackling this as a, as a, as a team is, is really important. Uh, Dan, anything else you want to add to that? No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. It, it definitely is a, is a team sport. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it, the, the finance team by themselves, I mean, uh, how can they really understand your cyber liability insurance needs? Uh, because probably they don't really understand your cyber uh, risk profile. And then, and then you know, once, once you have this team together, I, I think, uh, you know, a positive out of this is that, that other people within the organization, you know, like finance, like legal, like management, will have a better understanding of, of cybersecurity and what the risk is for the organization. And I think that's, that, that helps IT and the security team as they're trying to make sure that the program is providing them with, uh, with the best protection they can. Great, thanks guys. Um, I, I know we're just about out of time here. I've got one last question I wanna, I wanna squeak in. Um, assuming that cybercrime does continue to grow, can carriers be hit so harshly that it could make insurance a financial burden on a company because they've had to raise their rates to such a high level? You know, I'm going to take a I'm going to take a first crack at this and and think back to something that we that we said at the beginning here in that the insurance companies don't want to pay out on things. And so they're driving their customers to build better security. And so uh, that's what I'm expecting to be one of the big outcomes of this is the requirements being pushed down from the insurance companies are going to get more and more stringent over time, rather than uh, completely going skyrocket on the rates. They need to have a better base level of security among their customers which is frankly one of the reasons that we take such an interest in this market because it aligns with how we operate and helping organizations build better security. Any, uh, uh, any thoughts, Dan or Michael, to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I think cyber crime is going to continue to grow. Um, and some carriers have already gone out of the business of cyber liability insurance just because of the losses that they uh, had over the last couple of years. And, and this is not just the insurance carriers themselves. Obviously, this is the reinsurance carriers uh, as well. One of the things uh, that uh, I'm, you know, to your point, Dave, I think that there's going to be more requirements. Uh, from a cyber liability insurance uh, perspective, as they better understand the market and as we all better understand uh, the cyber uh, security uh, environment. And the one last thing that I would say is that even though the rates have sort of skyrocketed over the last uh, you know two years, year and a half, two years, um, they still are less expensive in almost all cases uh, than, uh, than not having uh, the insurance, not paying for the insurance and having a data breach. Yeah, it, it, and I think that's a really important point there, Dan, to, to emphasize here. I mean, the insurance companies are in the business of selling these policies. And if they, if they raise their rights to such a point where it's cheaper to just take care of the, the, the breach yourself instead of having a policy, then they're going to go out of business. They're going to be able to sell these things. Keep in mind, you know, as Dave said, they don't want to pay out these policies. Um, as much as you are uh, using cyber liability insurance as a risk transference uh, part of your risk management program, it's it's a uh, it's a risk for them as well to take on this policy. And so, how are they going to mitigate their risk? Well, they're going to charge more, so it's 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 more expensive. But that's gonna that's gonna reach a, a limit uh, to a point where they can't charge any more. People aren't gonna buy the policy. So what's the other lever they can pull? Make it harder to get a policy. Have more stringent controls in place uh, so that the risk, uh, the likelihood of a breach occurring goes down. And that's that's where I think uh, we're gonna see most of the movement is gonna be in that making it more difficult, putting more stringent controls in place. Uh, in order to uh, attain or, or renew a policy. 
Well, great. Thank you again, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, everybody who took the time to join us. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we're going to post the recording of this on networksgroup.com as well as uh, our LinkedIn uh, page. So um, thank you very much. If you have additional questions, here's contact information to reach out, sales at networksgroup.com, or pick up the phone, and we'd be happy to chat. Thanks, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.